Listen, the longer we wait, the more this house fills up. Doing good so far. All right, look around. You guys ready? Okay, Paul, are you ready to worship? If Paul's ready, then we shall begin. If you guys are, you know, don't ask anybody else's opinion, we'll just leave it all up to Paul. Well, he was such a pivotal figure in the Bible, so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, isn't family awesome? <coughs> love getting into the holiday stretch where we spend more and more time with family. This is what happens. <laughs> All right. Come on, let's worship together this morning. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all oh, see how great and how great is our God. Let's sing that together, come on. And how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all oh, see how great. 
How great is our God Who can see some name above all names And he's worthy of all praise Still my heart will sing How great is our God Let's sing that again is a name above all names, and he's worthy of all praise. Still, my heart will see how great is our God, and how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All see how great and how great is our God. Let's sing it one more time together. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All see how great and how great. people said amen boy i appreciate that guys thank you so much what a blessing amen wow so appreciate you guys thank you um would you open up in god's holy word to luke chapter one this morning luke chapter one and uh 
I'm going to remind you of a few things coming up. Let me first of all welcome you to church this morning. And uh, what a great crowd we have here today. It's good to see Miss Liana here with us. Amen. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And so good to have our guests and our visitors that are here with us as well. Make sure to uh, get around and greet them here in a little bit, if you would, please. Today we're going to talk about magnifying the Christ of Christmas, magnifying the Christ of Christmas. Tonight, business meeting, 6 p.m., we'll be having that's an important meeting, the, uh, um, oh, the uh, <laughs> report, the finance report and our minutes from last uh, month are on the back there. We're going to be uh, presenting a budget. Uh, giving that to folks to look over and then I believe that last Wednesday night of December having a special meeting to be able to vote that in just to give people time I believe that's December 29th uh, we'll be taking care of that um, December 18th women's Christmas party 11 a.m. Uh, the 19th uh, will be uh, ignore that second church business meeting okay that's uh, today so anyways I guess Anyways, forget that. Uh, 19th, Christmas caroling from 4.45 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, no evening service that night. We're going to take the church on the road, if you will, and go sing to some folks. So if you can come and be a part of that, 4.45. Who do we need to see? Who's heading that up? Miss Karen? Yeah. <laughs> Why would that be, Miss Karen? Do we... <laughs> Mm, definitely. Will they? Okay, great. Thank you, Miss Anita. Appreciate that. Yes, I'll let you uh, contact the police department. Let them know we're, we're going to be out uh, spreading joy. <laughs> so, hope not. December 26th, no evening service, so but be aware of that. We know folks will be with family, have a lot of family, and we will be having that morning service, so come be a part of that time together. We had a uh, wonderful two things went on this week. Uh, big things there Thursday night. The juniors met and had their uh, Christmas train gathering there, watched the Polar Express. Uh, had a great time, great turnout. I appreciate the ladies putting that together. Uh, Lacey and Joe Lee and others that were involved. Appreciate them very much. And then last night, Brother Randy Miss Suzanne had the teen Christmas party. I'm taking it. Had a great time. Yes, amen. Appreciate you guys doing that for him. I, I really do. Um, anyways, that being said, turn your Bible, if you haven't already got there, Luke 1, 46, Luke chapter 1 and verse 46 this afternoon. It is good to be here in the Lord's house with you. Uh, had an opportunity to meet a young man. I always like to meet those people that are dating my daughters, uh, right? <laughs> uh, anyways, a nice, uh, very nice young man, very, uh, very nice, and enjoy getting to meet uh, Paul. Uh, Paul is a Marine. He is serving uh, over in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, ask that you'd be in prayer for him. He is it got word while he was here uh, that he will be having to go to uh, to um, uh, Ukraine next week. He is his job. His part of his job is guarding embassies and stuff. And so uh, he stands guard in embassies. And so they're sending them over to assess, I guess, the uh, the possible threat levels and stuff. So. Uh, with everything ramping up with Russia, uh, it is something uh, that we know who's in control. Amen. Uh, but uh, certainly be in prayer for men like him and ladies like him that'll be serving in that capacity. Uh, it's possible to John. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but if they do get things ramp up, the fourth division, infantry division in Fort Carson is who's he, who he is attached to there. His, uh, his uh, department, I guess you would say, I'm saying that wrong, I know, but with the uh, combat engineering and all of that, they're attached to that. And so if they go, it's very uh, possible that, that he'll have to go too. And they're, that's their area that they're supposed to be um, overwatched. So anyways, just keep those in your prayer. We know the Lord knows. Uh, magnifying the Christ of Christmas. Uh, let's read, if we could, here in Luke chapter 1, 46 through 47. God's word says, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. I love that, don't you? My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And all God's people again said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to break the bread of life with these sweet folks. Thank you for the wonderful time of, of, of singing, of worship, Lord, of lifting our voices to you. And, and I pray, God, that it has risen as a sweet-smelling savor before you, Lord. And, and God, that our hearts are prepared uh, our minds are ready. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with my voice. Help me to say only what you once said here today. Uh, Lord, please, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, let Christ be magnified and lifted up. Let your people be fed. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 
You know, I remember thinking back uh, as a kid, young guy, uh, Christmas was always kind of a magical time, and we had kind of a habit or a ritual that we would do. Uh, as kids, uh, the Christmas Eve time was usually spent at my dad's uh, parents' place, my grandparents on my dad's side, and then that morning, uh, Christmas morning, we would go over and eat and share Christmas with my, uh, my mom's family. And so I remember being over at my dad's place. They lived down in Tulsa, west side of Tulsa. Uh, and we would drive back usually during the evening. And I just remember staring out the window, looking at the stars, uh, thinking it's getting, it's getting close, right? I, I remember going to bed, not really going to bed, but just laying in bed, staring up again at the ceiling, uh, anxious for the morning to come. I think between my sister and I, neither one of us got any sleep, probably accumulated, a cumulative of... Uh, uh, a, a combined maybe 10 hours total in the 17 years that I lived there <laughs> over Christmas time sleep uh, is what I'd have to say. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it was because we were excited. It was, a, it was a wonderful time. We grew up in a Christian home, though, and we knew what it was all about. We knew what the real story was all about. We knew it was about Jesus Christ, not Santa Claus. Amen? Uh, we understood that, certainly. But it was kind of a, a, a wonderful time of the year. However, not everyone approaches the Christ of Christmas or that season itself with such admiration or reverence or wonder or awe. Sometimes in the hustle of life we forget to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. As many of us know, Christmas time can produce a lot of unwanted stress in our lives, in our already overburdened lives, we might say. Uh, again, fast forward about, gosh, 30 years or so, my wife and I, young parents, uh, young in the ministry, uh, leading a church, it seemed like Christmas went from being something that was exciting to share with our children that uh, having to rush to this event to that event to this over here and to that over here and and I got to be honest with you we became burned out on it to the degree that we just almost dreaded Christmas and I know I'm not the only one in here that probably has faced that pretty soon we really did miss the true meaning of Christmas we were focused on this over here and that over here and this party and that uh, a special singing and this over here it, to the point that we we really did lose focus on Jesus, sad, sad to say. For others, Christmas can be a lonely time, even a depressing one. Uh, we think of the loved ones that we've lost or those who can no longer be with us. Uh, certainly, there will be those who have to spend the holiday alone. I think, of, again, of our military uh, and others as well. And by the way, to any that would uh, be in that situation, here's an opportunity to serve Christ by reaching out to those folks and checking on them and letting them know that they're valuable and that they're important to you and, and just checking on them and letting them know you're praying for them. Maybe send them a card or, or something else. I don't know. Uh, but just letting them know that, hey, I, I haven't forgot you. Neither has the Lord. Amen? And uh, it's an opportunity to do something along those lines. Well, I believe it's time, my friends, that we refocused, got our focus back on the Christ of Christmas. It's about time that we magnify Jesus once again. You see, Mary, upon hearing this supernatural, incredible news uh, by the angel Gabriel that she would give birth to the Son of God, right, said this, verse 46, Luke 1, 46, uh, said, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. What a beautiful thing to hear. Amazing, isn't it? You know, we saw last week that Mary may have initially began uh, this whole experience by being overwhelmed or maybe uh, uncertain of how this was all going to play out. Um, it, it, she may have began like that, but she didn't continue in that manner. In fact, she, she quite her attitude changed uh, drastically in, in what is commonly referred to as mag Mary's Magnificent. There we go. We see a powerful truth reveal the importance of magnifying our Lord, the importance of magnifying Him. And we'll give a definition to that here in a minute. But my challenge to all of us this morning is to do as Mary did, simply saying, let us seek to magnify Jesus in our lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our church, in whatever God calls us to do, let Christ rise above it all. Amen? And that's the way it should be. In fact, let us begin actually by seeing the negative side of this, if we could. We won't end with there, but, but let's begin by looking at magnifying the wrong priorities in life. And I, I'm going to tell you something real quick here, friends, and the reason why this is so important is because when we magnify our troubles, when we magnify the wrong priorities in our life, God becomes very small. But when we magnify God in our life, we magnify Jesus in our life, all those other things, they then become small, don't they? 
and God becomes great big to the point that he surrounds us in everything that we say, do, and see, and act, and think. So let's talk about that real quick. A few years ago, America's Funniest Home Video showed a young boy on Christmas morning, came down to see a large present, sitting beside the tree, ran over to tear it open to see what was inside. Paper, of course, went flying, and suddenly he broke into a dance, jumping around the room, saying, wow, just what I really wanted, I love it, wow, ran around uh, uh, thanking his parents, and then finally, after he got settled down, turned, looked at it once again with a puzzled look on his face, and asked this question, what is it? No, what is it? It's great. I love it, but I don't know what it is, right? Sometimes we approach Christmas like that, right? It's exciting. We know we're supposed to be excited because we've got beautiful scenery here and we've got the lights twinkling and all the things. Thank you, Brother Matt. Uh, we <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in there. Little plug. Uh, anyways, uh, that's an inside thing if you don't know. Uh, all these things, right, that, uh, that Christmas time has become uh, in our minds, right? but sometimes we just miss the whole boat altogether because we're magnifying the wrong things, the wrong issues. Uh, may, I, may I say today that one of those issues that I think we, we oftentimes move our eyes off of Jesus and onto this issue for happens to be our wants. It happens to be our wants. You know, it, it, it is tragic that we have the opportunity to think about the greatest gift ever given, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But Christmas time, and not just Christmas time, but, but all of life really becomes a time of, of, hey, I want that. They have that, so I've got to get something a little bit better. They've got a truck, so I want a nicer one, right? They've got this over here. Their houses are twinkling brighter, so my house has to be a little bit brighter than their house, right? They've got this size blow-up sand out in the front yard. i got to have something bigger, right? You know what I'm saying, keeping up with the Joneses and all of that, right? Magnifying our wants. Uh, this, ev this is evidenced by the amount of debt that is often stacked up around Christmas time. Do you know back before COVID, 2019, statistics showed this. Uh, it showed that Americans took out an, on an average, this is just average, on top of their other debt, about $1,300 worth of holiday debt. Most of these holiday spenders didn't have a plan to pay it off by January, it was just an extra $1,300. Some of you may be thinking, that's actually kind of small. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe that's the case. A recent statistic tells us something a little different. It, it shows us that some 63%, this is today, some 63% of individuals plan on taking out record amounts of credit card debt to pay for Christmas this year, taking into account that some people aren't able to get back into their jobs yet and all the stuff that COVID has done. We understand to some degree, but, but think about it. It's our wants, right? I gotta have this, this new thing. I want this, right? By the way, did you know the Lord has promised to give us our needs? But he has never promised to give us our wants. Do you realize that? We kind of flip those two things around. He said, oh, wait a minute. Now, I understand the Bible says in Psalms that, that God does often honor us when we honor him by giving us the desire of our heart. But when we're honoring him, the desire of our heart ought, uh, absolutely lines up with the will of God, amen, right? And so getting back to this idea of, of being a very, uh, um, sometimes a, uh, uh, being a country or a nation, if you will, that, that really chases after the almighty dollar and chases after what it can purchase. Here's what Jesus said, Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. He said, your life isn't identified, it isn't characterized by how much stuff you can accumulate during Christmas or any other time of the year, right? He said, that doesn't make your life any better or any worse. In fact, it may, it may make it a little worse, more troublesome, certainly, right? Having to keep track of all that stuff, okay? Uh, he said, it doesn't, that's not what life is about. And it's certainly not eternal life right? It's not going to get you to heaven, how much stuff you have, right? So he says, beware of that. Folks, let's be careful, if we could, about magnifying our wants. Second thing that we need to be wary of uh, during the holiday season and throughout all of life, um, we notice this, as we said already, a lot of times the holiday season isn't a time of joy for people because to them they're magnifying problems, 
and issues going on in their life, worries even. Look at what we're going through today in our country and all the things that are going on. And, and look, I'm not trying to point a finger, and I'm not saying, how dare you do that. No, 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 I got it. I understand, right? We're looking at uh, store shelves not being stocked. We're looking at higher gas prices. You know the story. You've, you've seen it. You've experienced it. And it would be very easy for us then to focus in on the problems at hand, right? be very easy for us to go around with a woe is me attitude thinking that you know what life has just fallen through and to focus in on our problems and our issues to make God very small in life and our problems very big but again and by the way Job said this and certainly if anybody could say it Job could he said in Job 14 1 man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble right for a lot of people the Christmas time is a very depressing time of the year that's just reality, right? Um, here's what Jesus had to say. Let me give you some good advice in what he shares with us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, I think this will help us not magnify our problems or our worries. The Lord Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you should put on. Is not the life more than the meat, and the body than the raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father does what? He feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus said, listen, if he looks after the sparrows, he's looking after you. In fact, he goes on later to say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things. He said, shall be added unto you. Give it over to God. Let God run with it. Let God take care of it. Amen? Don't magnify your wants or your, or your problems and your worries. The third thing, and this may not really have much to do with Christmas. Maybe it does, but it really just life in general. Let's be careful about magnifying self, ourself. Um, it's a very easy mistake to make, and believe it or not, John the Baptist was tempted with this mistake uh, when a certain disciple came to him upset that much of his crowd John's crowd had begun to leave him and to follow Jesus and however the Bible gives us John's humble and appropriate response when he says this in John chapter 3 26 look at this and they came unto John and he said unto him rabbi he that was with thee beyond the Jordan to whom thou bearest witness bearest witness behold the same baptizeth and all men come to him right John answered and said a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. Boy, that's important advice right there. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but, but that I am he that is sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled, he said. He must increase, and I must decrease. Boy, that's it right there, isn't it? Jesus must increase, I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of this earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, John said. Wow, I don't think he was having a struggle there with magnifying self because he recognized that he must decrease while Jesus must increase, right? We must decrease, Christ must increase. Folks, I'm going to tell you, if we would live with that principle, in our life 24 7 right that's the key isn't it and I say well it's easier said than done pastor we do have a flesh that fights against us I got it but ask yourself this question every morning you get up and every night you go to bed who sits on the throne of my heart today who rules the throne of my heart today who guides and directs this person this body this life these attitudes right and so let's be careful let's be cautious about very careful about magnifying the wrong things this Christmas. Instead, let's magnify the Christ of Christmas. Before we get to that, let me share a passage, Psalm 34. Jared, if you would, I'm going to jump over a couple of verses. Here's the thing. What happens when we begin magnifying God, it's a beautiful thing. Oh, magnify, verse 3, the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Jump down to verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in him. He said, if you would just taste and see, if you would experience God and understand how wonderful he is, man, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to stop talking about him. You 
magnify him every opportunity you got and that you get because God is wonderful and a relationship with him is a beautiful thing when you come to know what it means to be redeemed redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb redeemed and so happy in Jesus his child and forever I am as the old hymn goes wow magnify the Lord taste and see that God is good experience him on a first-hand basis that's what happens when we start looking back to the Lord Jesus Christ now let's talk about magnifying the Christ of Christmas Webster's dictionary defines this term magnify as making something greater but I want you to know that as we as it pertains to our Savior as it pertains to the passage and spe specifically there we go I want you to understand that we couldn't make him any greater than he already is that's not possible there's nothing you or I are gonna say that's somehow gonna add on to who Jesus is right and so that's not what Mary was really getting at right if I could submit to you this morning what we can do however while we can't make him any greater than he already is what we can do is put such a focus on him that he prevails in our attitude he prevails in our thought life he prevails in every action that we take every motive that we have and every emotion that we experience we can magnify him in that manner you see as we look again to our passage we find the words of Mary very refreshing actually Luke chapter 1 46 Mary said my soul it doth magnify the Lord my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior What was this present that she through the enablement of the Holy Spirit would would bring into the world what, what was he well the angel Gabriel just a little earlier had told her exactly who he would be and that's what I want to just focus on now for the last portion of our of our time together in verse 31 if you jump there Luke 1 31 you're going to find what the angel Gabriel said to Mary and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shalt bring forth a son you shall call his name what or who Jesus and he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and his reign and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Wow. 19th century preacher by the name of Philip Brooks put it best, best when he said this. He was born, referring to Christ. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then for three years he was an itinerant preacher, never wrote a book, never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He never went to college. He never traveled 200 miles further than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that would usually accompany greatness in this life. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away from him. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 19th century, 19 centuries at the point of his writing this have come and gone. And today he is the central figure of the human race, the leader of a column of progress. He said, I am for within the mark, far within the mark, when I say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on earth as has that one solitary life, Jesus Christ. No wonder why Gabriel said what he did. Mary, you need to know who you're bringing into this world. Let's magnify three thoughts here. Let's focus in on three different aspects of who Jesus is. Let's magnify, first of all, the name of Jesus. His name. Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, sweetest name ever uttered, Jesus. Juliet once asked Romeo, by the way, how many were made to read that when you were in school? Nobody ever reads that book because they want to. You realize that? <laughs> we I always hear this. We had to read that book along with a whole slew of others, right? It's not like you're picking it up for casual reading. Anyways, she once asked this question, what is in a name? She then answered it herself by saying, that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. In other words, she's saying names don't have as much of an impact as we often make. Well, names do make a difference, though, don't they? At least the name of Jesus Angel's announcement to Mary included uh, the name of our Savior. He would be called Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that no other name was given for such a purpose. In Matthew chapter 1, 
Verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, Joseph is told. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. What an incredible purpose to speak to the name, right? Uh, no other name, the Bible tells us, that there's never been a name given that is as precious and as powerful as that of Jesus. By his name, devils were cast out, the dead raised to life, the broken were healed. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says, and John and Peter Peter said, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. By his name, broken people were healed. In fact, it's only by his name that a person could be saved. Acts 4.12 tells us very simply, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no salvation found in the name of Buddha. There's no salvation found in the name of Joseph Smith. There's no salvation found not even in the name of Moses, as good a man as Moses was. No salvation found in the name of Paul, as wonderful a man as Paul was. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the precious name, Jesus Christ. Magnify, magnify his name in your life, not just during this time period, but all of life, right? What's more, and here's where you really need to fasten your seatbelts, if you will. <laughs> At the end of days, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that that name, the same name they rejected, the same name they mocked, the same name that people have ignored, that he is Lord to glory, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's truth, folks. What a blessing it is. No wonder why we should magnify the precious name of Jesus. By the way, let it never be, let it never roll off your lips the time to take uh, uh, his name in vain. In fact, you're breaking the, the third commandment. Do you realize that? That name is so precious. Don't use it in a meaningless way. Don't use it as a slur. Don't use it as any way that would bring it uh, any kind of uh, commonality, if you will, that would associate with it anything other than the fact that that he is the son of God and that he deserves all praise, honor, and glory. And when we sing about him, as we did just a bit ago, lift up your voices because you're singing about the name and the person of Jesus Christ. Second thing we need to magnify is actually the person of Jesus. You see, Gabriel said, he shall be great, verse 32, Luke 1. He shall be great. He shall be called son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. You know, the angel also relayed to Mary the fact that, that Jesus is the Son of God, that God had come to earth, the incarnate God. G. Campbell Morgan, who was a great preacher, it's long gone now, but he once spoke of our Lord's dual nature. This is something that's often uh, uh, given people time and theologians plenty to think about, but this is what he said. He was not God-man. He was the God-man, excuse me. He was the God-man, not God indwelling a man. Of such there have been many, not a man deified. Of such there have been none, save in the midst, midst of pagan systems of thought. But God and man, combining in one personality, two natures, a perpetual enigma, enigma and mystery baffling the possibilities of explanation. It's hard to understand, isn't it? It's incredible, though, when you think about it. In fact, Jesus told Philip, he said in John 14, 8, you've got to love this. John chapter 14 he said Philip saith unto him Lord show us the father and it sufficeth us sufficeth us there we go uh, you think about this right Lord we'll be happy if you just show us the father right kind of kind of laying out the um, all the uh, 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 the request whatever you want to say we'll we'll do it Lord we'll believe but, but boy, we'd sure like to see the father we'll be okay then we'll be satisfied right Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? How come you're saying this, Philip? Why? <laughs> Don't you get it yet, right? Don't you understand? You know, the hands and the feet that, uh, that walked this earth, that blessed children, that lifted Peter up out of the Sea of Galilee when he doubted, that were nailed to a cross, may have been human in appearance and biology, but they were completely divine in nature. It's incredible truth, my friends. You see, as the Son of God, He came to do that which only God can do. 
He came to provide a sacrifice that only God could provide. Not only did he do that, he came to be our great high priest, to walk in our skin, to know what it means to suffer as you and I have suffered, right? So when we talk about the, the person of Jesus Christ, we talk about magnifying who he is, and we're going to talk about this more on our candlelight service, on the different roles that he fulfills, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We're going to see all of that and, and what he does. In fact, we're going to read that here in a minute, but we're going to deal, deal with it a little bit more in our candlelight service um, it, it really is incredible to think about the fact that Jesus is all this guy right here and all you will ever need in life. If you think about it. Give that some thought for a second. He is all I will ever need. Well, I need air. Who produces that air? <laughs> Who keeps this planet spinning? Christ. Well, I need food. You know, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Right? The bread of life. I need water, Pastor. Great, I do too. My throat is actually a little parched today. But he said, I am the water of life. He said, he that drinks of this well will be thirsty again. But he that drinks of me will have this well inside them, springing up unto life everlasting. Right? I'm going to tell you something, my friends. The person of Christ, who he is, is more than enough. He is more than sufficient. He's not just enough. He is more than sufficient for everything that we have in our life and have need of in our life. And only he, hey listen, only he can meet the longing in your heart, friend. Only he can fit that void in your life and turn that void around and make it something that is so full and so wonderful and so blessed that you won't even be able to imagine. Let's magnify the person of Jesus. And finally, let's magnify the reign of Jesus. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, of his kingdom there shall be no end. You know, the angel's message spoke of something else that the prophet Isaiah, and I just mentioned, predicted long ago, long ago. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. The prophet said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, say it with me, church, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He goes on to say, Of the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal Lord of hosts will perform this. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, the Lord Jesus tells his disciples that one day he would set up an eternal kingdom here on this earth. In fact, theologians refer to this as the millennial reign of Christ. That is the literal thousand-year reign of Christ. Just real quick, let me break it down for you. Uh, if I could, in a timeline, a very quick timeline, no matter where you stand on the rapture, I'm a pre-trib guy, uh, and I respect your opinions. I expect that uh, people have difference, uh, differences of opinion, but I truly believe it, it, that the rapture will take place prior uh, to the seven years tribulation taking, uh, starting out, okay? Uh, and so once that happens, the bride of Christ rises to meet the Lord in the air. Seven years takes place on this earth in which the Antichrist and Satan himself works diligently, right, uh, to turn people's hearts towards them. People are going to be looking for all kinds of answers. The Jews are going to be looking for their Messiah because they have not believed in him yet for the most part, right? And so they'll at first see the Antichrist as their Messiah, thanking it, as he creates peace with them, a false peace treaty with them. Three and a half years into the tribulation, he will break that when he stands in the rebuilt temple committing the abomination of desolation when he basically presents himself as the God that they need to worship. And so now things turn on its head. The Jews run, he turns against the Jews, right? And that begins three and a half years of even greater tribulation, believe it or not. And at the end of that, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth to stand in place for his people and they will finally accept him as their savior, their long-awaited savior. They missed him the first time they won't the second, I promise you that. And he will step foot on this earth, physically step foot on the Mount of Olives. The Bible says it will split in Zechariah. It tells us split from the east to the west. And he will judge the Antichrist and his armies. He'll cast them immediately into hell, right? They'll judge Satan. He'll be locked away for a thousand years. And in that thousand year period, Jesus will rule on the throne of David, literally on this earth. It'll be an incredible time, folks beyond anything we can imagine, anything we can fathom, right? 
There will not be going to the polls. There will not be any election tampering. There will not be any COVID shots, amen, and any COVID issues. There won't be any of that business. It'll be Jesus Christ ruling and reigning with his people. It's going to be a beautiful time. You say, Pastor, what does that have to do with me right now? No, the good news is, it's just because the physical kingdom of Christ is not right here on earth right now at this moment, it is in your heart. In fact, he tells, uh, tells us that, Luke chapter 17, verse 20. He said, and when he was demanded of by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You have a throne in your heart, friend. You decide who sits on that, believe it or not, because of free will. Jesus is going to sit on that throne today his kingdom you belong to as a Christian right and because we belong to that kingdom we live by kingdom principles right that goes back to Matthew 5 through 7 and the Sermon on the Mount that's all about his kingdom principles you've heard it said but I'm telling you this you can look it up later on you'll see exactly what I'm talking about he said my kingdom is right here in your heart right now that's the way we live and we live every day of our life or we're supposed to as he is the king ruling over my life that's why we magnify him. That's why we magnify his reign. We don't have to wait to magnify his reign until that thousand-year reign of Christ takes place, until all of that happens, which may be, hey, listen, it may not be that far at all. I don't think it is, honestly. But the truth is, he ought to reign, rule and reign in my life and in your life today and in this church. Amen? Definitely, my friends. As we close things out here this morning, share this thought with you. The Lord Jesus, one man once said, whom we exalt today at Christmas. It's not just a baby in a manger. We kind of like thinking of that because it's sweet and it's beautiful and it's cute. But he didn't stay that way. He's not a character in a child's story. He's far more than that. You see, the first time he came, he came veiled in the form of a child. But the next time he comes, we believe it will be soon. He comes unveiled. And it will be abundantly and immediately clear to all the world just who he really is. The first time he came, a star marked his arrival. The next time he comes, the whole heavens will roll up like a scroll and all the stars will fall from the sky and he himself will then light it. The first time he came, wise men and shepherds brought him gifts. The next time he comes, he will bring gifts for his own. The first time he came, there was no room for him in the end. The next time he comes, the whole world will not be able to contain his glory. The first time he came, only a few attended his arrival, some shepherds, some wise men. But the next time he comes, every eye shall behold him. The first time he came as a baby, soon he will come as sovereign king of kings and Lord most high. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand, shall we? Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Can I ask you this morning, let me challenge you, if you will. Make sure that we are magnifying, not our problems, and I know there are plenty of them out there to magnify, always. Let's not magnify them. Not our wants. Sometimes there can be plenty of those, too. And certainly not ourselves. Let me encourage you to magnify the name of Jesus by praising Him, by exalting Him, by witnessing for Him, just like the shepherds did. Right? By telling people, i got to tell you how good my God is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Let me tell you about the time when I first entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what he's done for my family. Let me tell you what he's done for my life. Praise his name. Let me exhort you to magnify the person of Christ by remembering Christmas is a celebration of God. Come to earth as a human. He did it for you. He did it for me. By looking to him when we have our greatest needs, the Bible says because he is our great high priest, because that is who his person, that is who he is, we can come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need to find our help. He's inviting us to do such. Let me encourage you to magnify his reign by recognizing today that he has the sovereign right, he created you, he bought you with a precious price, his own blood. 